Okay, here I am. Uh, I want to wish you welcome to my channel. Uh, since you are here, I don't know if you are here the first time or the second time or the or you have seen my videos before, but my name is Knut André Vixolam. I'm a Norwegian figurative painter and this is my YouTube channel. Uh, on this channel I post uh, my oil painting lessons. This can be uh, landscapes, it can be uh, still lives, figure paintings, uh, some videos where I just uh, thinking out loud and uh, yeah and what I want, want with this channel is to help other people become better painters. I think that is a kind of a goal in itself. It is uh, great to know that and hear that people actually learn from uh, my videos. Uh, I used to have a bigger channel but it was actually hacked in I think it was in January 2020 and this is a new channel so I'm posting all my videos uh, again. At the time I didn't even have the source material so I had to download my own videos from YouTube and uh, I posted uh, them rapidly. So it's, this channel is not chronological. I kind of have, have posted the videos, uh, uh, not from the old ones to new ones. I'm actually now building up another channel which will be chronological and it's called Oil Painting with Artist uh, uh, Knut André Vixelan. And you can check it out, the link in the description. Uh, now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, who I am and why I paint. Uh, I started out as a welder uh, in a shipyard and I took my degrees in, the, in that, but because of some asthma problems and some stuff, I got the chance to get a new education and I went into a drawing school. I hadn't been drawing at all actually since I was 10 years old and it was actually a girlfriend of mine at that time that <laughs> made me start start drawing again and uh, it was like the first time I put the pen on paper that was only drawing. It was just love by first stroke because I'm typically an ADHD type of person, you know, and all the hypomania that comes with that. And I've always been training too much and eating too much and, you know, I do too much of everything all the time. But this is the thing that really calms me down and gives me that beautiful flow. So if you are a person with that kind of personality, is kind of all over the place, I mean, I would recommend that you do get a hobby or that you go into painting or some kind of art form to kind of get this this beautiful flow that will actually bring out the best in you over time. Uh, so I started first drawing, then I went to the school and I met this beautiful uh, teacher called um, Cecil Kobosta and she taught me to fall in love with, with paint. And uh, I remember uh, one of the painters I really loved was Halfdan Egerius. Uh, he died actually at the age of 21 because of some, some stuff that attacked his intestines. And then he died. And I remember this story about him and he said when he knew he was going to die, he said, Oh, and I should, I wanted to, to create so much. And sadly, he didn't manage to do that. And she, and the first time I actually starting to to paint, it was just also just love by first brush stroke. The first time you just you just focus your mind, and I worked like a child, and I I couldn't do any, I couldn't actually paint or do anything. I painted and drawed like a ten year old. Luckily, I was kind of blind to it, so I at that time I thought what I did was way better than it was actually was in an objective sense so it helped me to get over the first hurdles and into uh, I would say uh, uh, a place where it started to become a little bit better 
But anyway, after that uh, first year with drawing school, I went to an art school in Stavanger in Norway. It's called the Kunstskolen i Rogaland. And there I uh, was actually not in the best situation because I loved doing my kind of painting. Already then, after one year, I just wanted to make figurative art already then. I was had fallen in totally in love with paint and, and, and stuff like that. And uh, uh, but the art school was very good in creating um, a new start, a new personality, and also I remember we had some um, some course called Micro Marco, where we had a teacher, which sadly I heard is uh, died a few years ago, uh, a sculpture called uh, Krzysztof Nasilowski. It's a fantastic sculpture. And he taught me to understand the difference between objectivity and subjectivity. And that led to me realizing I couldn't trust the things I believed in. And I had to uh, start doing my own research and, and uh, start being so biased and all that. And it started a process where free will went out the window and I started to get started the journey into deeper kind of introspection which has led to to changes in me that is just it's almost like going from from existing just existing to deep introspection and that is a thing that will evolve as you as you uh, progress as a person in relationship to what you do and what you experience and stuff like that. So, but it's very, very important to be very honest, don't believe in your own bias and seek out information. Now, I wanted to talk about, because I got this question all the time, what inspired me? And I have to say, the ones that inspired me the most is, uh, right now anyway, in the beginning was actually a Norwegian artist called Obnadrum, back in the 90s. And he is one of the best painters in the world, I would say. I never went into becoming a student of him because I thought if he, he is human, he taught himself to paint. And, if, uh, and I'm human and I can teach myself to paint. So... I decided not to. Also, he's very much an alpha male, and I'm kind of a little bit alpha myself. So, it could probably lead to some some uh, some uh, conflicts that I didn't want to do. He have actually created one of the best paintings in the world. I think is my. It's called uh, what is it called again? It's some glasses here. Sorry. It's called Girl with a Doorknob or something. Yeah. Yeah, door, <laughs> girl with a doorknob. She's just holding a doorknob in a landscape. At that time, his his colors were also very nice and more, more lively because I I love using colors. I love love um, the the impressionist. I love uh, 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 using clear colors. And Odnadrum now doesn't like to use color at all. So his paintings is quite different but he's still one of the best painters by far. Uh, my other things that inspired me is of course Rembrandt. He's one of the, 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 I would say he's the greatest painter ever lived. Then you have William Turner which is probably the greatest landscape painter that ever lived. And then you have the greatest artist that ever lived and that is of course Leonardo da Vinci. I mean, he is just amazing, and this this book is his memoirs, and uh, if you read it, you will understand what I mean. He was a realist already back then. Also, you have Johannes Vermeer, which is one of my great favorites, and it's because of his uh, paintedness uh, and his clarity. And what I want to do, I also love uh, Delacroix, and of course, I do love. Edvard Munch, and but basically, it's the what fascinates me most with Edvard Munch is basically his four, first years when he painted uh, *Sick Child* and and the things that were really painted, 
Uh, most of his later works, I just feel is more sketches and the most famous one, Scream, I don't mind, care about at all. I just think it's, a, I think it's hyped. Anyway, so that is what inspires me. Now, what colors do I use? Well, I am using Old Holland, basically, and I base it in the primary colors. That is what I use. I think that gives the best, because I like to build my paintings like sculptures. I like to build them. Uh, it's of course painting them, but I like to build them. So I also use this uh, boar or pig brushes to, to get all kinds of uh, textures and brushwork. But you can see that in my videos. I have a palette like this I set it up almost like this is almost the same thing I have different uh, different uh, reds and different yellows and different blues and stuff uh, but I also you find videos on my YouTube channel where I explain all this uh, I also gonna gonna put in down uh, in this video I'm gonna have uh, take some of my shorter uh, uh, not lessons, but shorter instruction videos about what colors I use, what brushes I use, what medium I use, and uh, stuff like that. I'm just pu put them into this video, and you will find um, um, find um, uh, chapters in description, so you can just jump to the different topics if you wanna. Because many people ask me all the time what kind of brushes I use and what kind of stuff I use and. And it's easier for me to post this in one video, so we'll find it all there. Uh, yeah. Now, I think that kind of covers it. I want to welcome you to my channel. I hope you can give it a, give my 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 uh, videos a thumbs up and leave a comment and ask me questions in the description and if you want to support my channel you can do that in many ways you can actually share my videos you can become a patron supporter I have a patron page you will find a link in the description and after this video and uh, uh, if you become a patron I will engage with you on patron and teach you how to paint I uh, yeah so you can check that out if you want to uh, but the greatest thing you can do for me is actually sharing my videos and give a thumbs up and leave comments and stuff like that So you're forcing my videos into the algorithm uh, Yeah So I think I have quite quick quickly explained the basis of what I'm doing and who I am I started didn't start out as an artist. I just Painted like crazy because that is what I love to do and was loved by first brushwork and I just kept on doing it and as I usually say if I could learn how to paint so can you there is nothing stopping you except one thing you're not doing it keep on doing it keep on being self-critical and you will evolve into a painter over time I'm not saying I'm there yet I know I have a lot to learn and I'm learning still learning like a child so, in my, the rest of my life, I will use to become a better painter. And uh, in the end, I will never reach the level of, of these painters that I love, but I will reach the level I can. I will, and it's also nice to know that I give something back to humanity. As Horace Mann said, you should be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity and uh, winning a victory is like helping one person to better himself and that could be enough and with this I will say cheers and happy new year with my big cup of coffee and I hope to see you in my videos and I hope to see your comments and I hope to that it helps you to become a better painter. So, with this, also check out my other, other, other channels. you find links in the description. And of course, my Patreon. I'm trying to turn off this now. Sorry. Uh, 
Hello, my fellow Earthlings. In this uh, shorter uh, instruction video, I show you how I clean the palette, how I took away old paint and made it ready for another day. I also teach you how I or show you how I what colors I use and how I set them up, how I think. I show a little bit how I make skin tones. Uh, and I hope you get something out of it because reusing palettes can actually be a good idea especially when you get to a point where you have palettes everywhere okay you just don't want to buy new ones you want to start re reusing them actually that's money too you know so I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you get something out of it. I hope that you can leave a comment, that you can subscribe to my channel, that you can help me by sharing, sharing my videos with your artsy friends. And you can also, if you want to support my channel, I have a small painting giveaway on Patreon every month. Uh, to one of my patrons and uh, you can get your hands on that for only five dollars if you want to support me with one whatever that's great too so if you want to support your artist go to patreon and do that and if not you can support me by putting a notification bell on it's over there and on my channel and um, just keep watching it really helps thumbs up it's even better. So, until next time, keep painting, keep living, keep having fun. So, okay, as you can see, this palette is quite, uh, has a lot of color on it, a lot of textures, and that can be a problem. So I'm gonna show you what I do with it. I just gonna kind of um, do like this, a little bit more up like this. So I just to instead of buying new palettes all the time, which is not that uh, that expensive, but you kind of fill up with them until yeah you know you should do like this so I can show, see show you how I set my palette up and clean it I kind of like to take care of my palettes especially the older ones for some reason I'm just gonna use some of the sandpaper piece of some old wood I have and I just do like this instead of take away most of, most of the textures It's a lot of pigment. I, I do actually love the texture that kind of comes into. Uh, I, I feel it's almost sad doing this because when you work for a long time, the textures are becoming. Very turnaround actually. Then. All the all the touches, all the brushwork, everything you actually do is oh, tattooed on your palette. But this one is getting thick now, and it's it affects my ability to work. I just do like this. a little bit more. I'm going to take some turpentine.
Sharp. And uh, wash it with some water, nice turpentine and, and paper. Gets. So, so then, uh, take away all the excess pigment. Just gonna take it off like this. And when you work over time, as I say, you get the same textures that you see in the thick layers of, of the cloth in Rembrandt's paintings and other master, old master paintings. It's a very lovely texture. Uh, but then again, this is a tool. So, yeah. I just have to keep on doing this. You see all the pigments here. You just keep doing this until you get cleaned up. It smells so great. It smells like, it smells like victory. <laughs> like the movie Apocalypse Now. You smell this. You smell this. It's Napalm, man. It smells like victory. I actually love the smell of turpentine. I see a lot of people are using the odorless one. Okay, I will just keep um, uh, doing this and then I will show you how I set up my palette, which colors I use. So, yeah. Okay, here we are. I just washed, you see all the things I washed away. Put some away on my table using this table for guests and everything but now you can see it's kind of it feels smooth I still have the textures the beautiful things that has happened to it but it is not long any longer disturbing me okay so maybe I'll do a little bit more cleaning so and see, take some, some paper, Let's see if there's some more pigment on it. So, yeah, that's even better. See now. Now I can actually feel the textures, the beauty is still here. Can see where I place the different colors, and I'm going, that's exactly what I'm going to show you now. Okay, so okay, here is my tools, my colors, and everything you can see. And uh, what I usually do, I have this big tube of uh, Titan White. It's uh, from Old Holland, of course. I love this color because it is so thick and it has, as I said many times in my videos, it has the, the thickness of clay in a way. I also use this uh, Naples, uh, Naples Gable Rudish Extra. Naples Gel Rudish Extra and I put this over here what is important I think is to have the same thing on every palette almost the same way there's a different palettes with different shapes I can show you some of them after this and then I put a little bit different but it's basically the same it's called Brilliant Gel Light or Brilliant Yellow Light 
really like this one. I put that here. So you might ask why I use these broken colors. Uh, yeah, I actually have one more from uh, Vincent Newton that I use. Uh, one out of few, actually. And, uh, where are you? Yeah, it's called uh, Naples Yellow Light. I guess you also find it in in Old Hall, but it has this yellowish feel to it. Let me see. Let's use a. I'm not good at putting the caps on. So here, that's how I did that. Usually, I, I only use Old Holland mainly. Uh, I also use one more actually from um, Vincent Houston called uh, Blue Black. I'll show you that too. Um, but I use this one, Blue Black, or I used uh, Ivory from uh, uh, Old Holland. So maybe I just put down both today. So I put them over here and I take the blue black, put over oh shit, it's a new tube. So that's the problem with with uh, that is why I switched actually from from uh, Winsor Newton to you see this, it comes too much oil. So oily, so annoying. And this is actually high quality too, so it's too much oil in them, I think. Maybe I should just take that away. You don't want that much oil. Uh, as you can see, I didn't plan this so good. Uh, I like it to keep it a little bit more. Now, I Actually, I wasn't gonna tell anyone that I used this one, but now I am. So here you, here now we have everything. Uh, I think it, it just gives a more bluish uh, tone to everything, and I used the French ultramarine blau. It can be felt ultramarine um, dunker or this one, which is a little bit bluer. But I also have one called uh, dunker or. Yes, it's a very expensive colors so color, uh, and you have the cobalt blue, the clean one, the beautiful one, and I put that one over here. I have these big. Some of the I have a lot of these big tubes too, because when I really start getting into the paint, I'm kind of burning through all the. And here you have the 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 blue of the blue. Or the, the, the most, I hated this actually, this color in the beginning because it was so hard to control. It is a Prussian blue, it's very hard to control. But when you manage to understand it, and this one goes, kind of gets every, every yellow into the, into the green. And it can actually take red, you can mix it with all all the other colors and you can push it to the green or to the reddish and you just go back and forth. Now this one, that is the one I use basically to blend my flesh tones with. I also these, but these, but I always blend, if I use, I always use the, the primary colors to blend into these to create for flesh tones and stuff. Uh, and it's called um, Naples Naples Gel Extra. I just love this one. It has this neutral uh, tone to it, and it's just if you kind of mix it with uh, I'm gonna put on some with a cadmium. Uh, that is that's a vermilion. Vermilion. I usually put this here. It is a little bit toned to the blue side. And here you have the 
uh, kraplak or, or alzarin kraplak extra, which I put over here. And the beautiful thing is that I'm going to get a pencil. This is a cadmium red, same mark, you see I'm, I should take better care of my, my tubes. I would recommend that if you are using Old Holland because it's very expensive. What I, I think, what's nice with this is if you mix these two together somewhere, doesn't matter where, okay let's do it here. These ones are beautiful to get a kind of a reddish type of skin tone okay and when you do that you can just mix in this and you can go back and forth or you can go with deeper into the red with using this and then back up again and uh, maybe take some yellow that's just that is the cadmium yellow cadmium light actually cadmium yellow light and uh, you take this one and you mix into these and it starts to become more against the yellowish and you see how the colors here are kind of and then you can get some here and you can have it into the green zone again and this one you can put in and you get all the kinds of nuances you can imagine and you can mix in the cadmium reddish and get down again and you take this and it goes against the orange and you can keep on doing that and you of course mix in the the whites and you can yeah so that is how I think when I paint skin tone so now you know now that was the cadmium light I also use cadmium lemon and ca but you have to get a primary color cadmium lemon. This is a cadmium a cadmium yellow deep. I put that on beside here. Now, why do I have so many colors? You might ask. It is because if I should, and this is a cadmium cadmium yellow extra deep. It's almost orange, but it's not really orange. And here. It's cadmium orange. So what this gives me is the all the middle tones. Okay, and uh, then I go over to the. Uh, for some reason, I put that here. I put down the uh, burnt sienna here. And I want to put down the, let me see, uh, didn't I, yeah, there it is. This is Rosiana. I also sometimes use, I don't have it right now, um, Uko. But this is kind of Uko for me. If I mix it with other colors, I get the Uko tone, so. I, I don't usually don't use ochre for some reason. Raw umber, I put the raw umber all the way down here, and uh, then you have the burnt umber. I put it over here, and I have the brown. My favorite brown. It's the Van Dyke brown which I actually put over here, okay. So as you can see, I have three blue. I could have more, I could have, but I don't. And so, but this is kind of the primary, I have the primary colors as the basis or the reddish and primary colors. And from this, from this, from this piano, I almost call it my piano, I can create all the different tones that you see in my paintings. 
So it's not that advanced. And I and what I do, as you can see, I put the palette up the same way every time. Okay. And uh, I also use these uh, uh, bore bristles or uh, from, uh, I'm going to show you. See that? This one. Uh, on. So, and we have a jerk, so we have a jerk. Ah, I buy these. Pencils from Da Vinci. It's, cool. it's not that expensive, and I love the way they are creating all the almost um, cotton-like or uh, cloth-like uh, textures when you paint with them. Um, and I, this is the oil I use. It's Cremolin something, and uh, Cremolin oil vernis, some German thing. And I also mix in the retouche furnace when I before I glaze. And this is the turp, balsam turp that I use. Yeah, so I hope this is helpful for you. Uh, if not, it's just too bad, isn't it? But now you know how we can fix these things. And I'm going to do that myself, start taking better care of my my colors and stuff. But remember, this is this is this is the tool. And when I when I oh, I'm going to show you. As you've probably seen, when I paint I have this thing here over my arm and I just have this I take like this fills fills that cup off with a mix between 30 percent uh, uh, the 30% of the oil and 70% of the top and what happens when I paint actually is that I just dip it I let's see if I can zoom no I can't uh, okay, so what I do when I paint, I just dip it like this and I take another color. And then I paint and I dip it and I just kind of take away. I might mix some colors on my sound. This is greenish now. And if I want some other color and then I paint and then I dip it, I just wash it off, wash it off. And I pick a new color. And I just keep on dancing around, basically automatically, and building the painting. Actually, you can actually have a uh, uko here, but if I want to, or some other colors here, if I need to. So, but basically, this is this is the palette I use. Uh, I have some skin underneath this, so I don't get it on my skin. Uh, to protect my health a little bit. So, with this, I hope that you uh, got something out of it. And uh, yeah, never know. Maybe you do. Okay. Yay. See ya. Now remember to give this a thumbs up and leave a comment and uh, yeah, okay. Hello YouTubers, it's me again, Norwegian artist Knut Andre Vixolan. And I'm just making this shorter video about how I use my gesso, how I prime a uh, prime uh, canvas, and uh, that's my gesso. 
and how I build uh, textures and stuff like that in the canvas. And uh, yeah, you can watch the whole process in this video. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it. It was quite enjoyable to make it. So, with this, how to use gesso and how to prime a canvas. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you in this video how I uh, prepare a uh, canvas. This is 40 plus 40 centimeters. It's not so big. And uh, uh, I'm going to show you basically the process. I just need to it like this. Now I measure a little bit so I have something to grab onto. I use my scissor and I just cut, 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 cut. So, and then I just start to, I start in the middle. Oh, fuck, did I put it back in? Funny enough, I forgot to put this in. Um, so, I do like this. I know some people are using uh, kind of a, you know, they grab it and they put it over my, I do like this. I just push it, pull it, and then do like this, pull, Bang. and I continue doing this all the way the canvas is linen and it has a layer from the store it has already a layer with, uh, with the gesso on it but I will actually put two layers extra with gesso on this canvas before I before I uh, start painting and I'm going to show you the whole process and also how you can actually use the primer or the gesso as a way to build textures in your painting and you see I just work myself around like this um, keep a little bit of a you don't need to have, have, they don't need to be so close. I want this to be a long video, so I'm just gonna try to do it quickly. Like this. And it's the same principle, it doesn't matter how big the canvas is. I use the same principle. However, how big it is. So. so, and then I do like this, pull it apart, drag it like this, and pull it here, do like this, and like this. I'm just going to finish it and then I'm going to film a little bit more. Okay, here we are. I'm done. I did this. And you see how I did it. It's quite... It's not, but you see it's kind of dirty and stuff. But the problem with a canvas is this. It's it's very... It has this layer of, of um, gesso on it. But it still has the... the uh, the linen texture 
and I find that very disturbing when I'm gonna paint because it disturbs when you do layers and you try to create the depth in the painting they these structure tends to send back a lot of disturbance all the small points in the uh, in the linen structure when you put oil paint on it and it's a little bit wet or it's it's kind of you try to create depth it will send out small tiny pieces of light from every small uh, surface uh, irregulation yeah, irre yeah, whatever you know what I mean so what I do I take my Lasco gesso it has a nice thickness to it Lascaux gesso uh, it has a nice thickness to it it is uh, kind of a, a it's not so fluid it has and I just use one of these and I just draw the first layer. It's, it's not that thick, but I kind of push the gesso into all the small uh, uh, linen textures and it covers it not totally. But it kind of makes it so the surface is getting smoother. What you are getting also, because you can't really get it all, uh, you can't get it all uh, smooth because it's it's a spoon, okay? So it also leaves some uh, some textures and stuff, but. It takes away a lot of the, the disturbing texture from the linen threads, or whatever you call them in English. Uh, so, so is this. Now, after the first layer, it will. There's water. It's water-based, so it's gonna kind of. Pull a little bit into the gesso who was already there, and then it becomes a little bit looser. So what I do, I just take these and I bang them into the sides while it's wet. Well, that is how I prefer to do it, and uh, to to um, make it a little bit more like a fiddle string, <laughs> that's what we say in Norway, it's kind of tight like a fiddle string. Um, and that makes it easier for me to, to um, put on the next layer, which I will do when this has dried. And I, I just do like this. I use High quality, both canvas and uh, and gesso. Also, the wood is high quality. Now you see, now it's like a fiddle. Um, I will let this dry, and I'm going to show you how I build texture compared to a motive I'm going to paint on it, or probably going to paint on it anyway. And um, yeah. I'm going to do the second layer in a little while. Okay. Yay! Okay. Layer number two. Uh, what I do now is there are still some um, um, structure left. This structure, this. Uh, I go over it one more time, and usually, then it disappears. Um, I don't mind, uh, because the first one, first layer, fell into all the 
holes or cracks or whatever you want. And now the second one is kind of covering it totally, which means it's about now three uh, layers. The first one is when I buy it in the store, which is just a wash. Uh, and uh, the second, I actually seen videos how they do it in the factory, and they they kind of put it on in huge little pencils and stuff, and, and uh, yeah, you also get a little bit of uh, structure now. I get a little bit of you know, structure when I do this. It's very hard to. Get it totally, totally smooth, but I think that's okay to have a little bit of structure. You can also go in and you can give it structures like this if you like. Uh, you can uh, take some cloth or some, you can even mix sand into it or spoon like from, from, uh, uh, wood, whatever, you can do a lot of stuff with it, how that will affect your painting long term, <laughs> you have to, I have not done it in myself, so I don't do that. Now, now it's covered, and uh, I can focus a little bit, you see the motif here, uh, I'm gonna Kind of give it how I also use the gesso is to give it some texture. I'm going to show you how it turns out in the end, anyway. You can actually, since this is a landscape from the Spawn, Spawny, Spawny River in where is it? I feel it. sent to me from one of my painter friends, one of my patrons actually, in America, and uh, he told me yeah, Spovny River here in Florida, okay, I live in North Florida. So it's in North Florida, motif. And he sent me these pictures and he asked me if I could paint one of them because he's a painter himself. And I thought it was quite beautiful, it's turnoresque, so I might do that. What, I, what you can do, you can use a brush where you know there is textures, like that stone there, you can actually start going into the canvas like this to or the gesso while it is very wet and you can actually paint the motif in you see you can actually paint the motif and it goes down here and uh, you be a little bit careful uh, but you can actually use the gesso to build some textures and structures. And here's the water, I want that to be flatter. And here you have, uh, you see, kind of comes in here, you have into the middle. And so why do this? I mean, you well, when you then put on, when I put on the uh, on the lasure, which I put on top because I use uh, Hohenbach and some turpentine over this after it has dried, you can actually, yeah, there's some branches here, up here. You don't want to. Uh, you can also let it uh, dry and you can do this over it but you you don't want to screw it up too much there 
The thing is, the foreground with the rocks and stuff, this is the place where I will actually go a little bit crazy with the structures and textures. Uh, you can see it in the in the Grisels or the of the classic classics. They used uh, kind of grayish, a grayish kind of oil type thing to create textures and structures from the before they put colors on. I think it's quite fun to do it with a. Uh, do it with the gesso. When this then dries, it has a little bit of structure. And then when you paint over that, all this structure, all this thing will kind of. I think always the fucking word can. Uh, it will will um, come in as a plus, you know. Uh, on top of this again, so you create more and more texture. I can see this photo is taken away and has had some problems with his photographing. And uh, now I don't want to do this in the water because there are some here, there are some different uh, textures from the you know, take that away now. Here is the sky. You have the th that line here, which is it's very yellow, but it has that turmoilish kind of feel to it. So I want to put in a little bit of textures here too, give it a little bit of a boost. Uh, I will also use a smaller. This is you don't need to do this. You can do all of this stuff with uh, with uh, your paint. Uh, because and you can go in directions and you can go back and forth and you can do all kinds of stuff. So you can actually create the painting in as I say in in the gesso first. Is that far enough now? Well, I think I probably did some mistakes here. This is to have to do like this. You can see now, and it's also a kind of a sketch before I start painting. I've done this in bigger paintings. You know, this is like half up here, uh, almost. So this one is. Uh, it's okay. It's kind of where it should be. This has to dry for a while. Then I will put on the other lasso. Okay. I'm going to show you what I do. Uh, you've seen it probably in other videos I have. Uh, if there, if this was a, if this was a, say there was a girl in a dress or a person. You could actually go, if there were textures in a dress, you can go out in with a smaller smaller pencil and just start doing this. I can do that here too, to create different textures. And this again, I can look at the rocks, I can, okay, this one is like this, and then, so, but you, as I say, you don't need to do this. You can just put on the gesso and paint on top of it. But the main thing with the gesso for me is to get rid of the, um, the canvas structure because it's very disturbing for, for these places where the water is and the sky it will be very disruptive for your eyes to do some 
flatten this out so it doesn't disturb. And now, as you see now, that dried a little bit, so it becomes a little bit more greasy. And when you go over that, you get a different texture here again. That reminds me a little bit more of clouds and sky. I do like this, and, you know, stuff like that. But you want to avoid the or control at least if you want the linen texture to be a part of the painting. You want it to be in places where you want it to be. If you want a flat surface with a lot of depth, you do not want that texture because it will disturb the depth of the painting when you do it. And it's also easier to, uh, it's, it's easier to paint on a surface that is, reminds you a little bit more of a uh, wooden board plate and stuff like that. Maybe there was a little bit too much here. Damp that down so it's more here because that is close. That is also important. More textures in what's closer to you. Less texture. The deeper you go, the less texture you have, because then you also create this, this uh, physical sculptural room in the painting. So there's a lot of things to think about. You have to figure this out kind of by yourself. The best thing, the best way to learn is basically to fail. I remember a friend I had. He's sadly dead now, but he taught me about using using uh, my first computers back in the day and he said the best way to learn is just press on it and see what happens. Now I kind of did that and I deleted my Windows operating system once and that's you think you only do once, you don't do that twice. So I wanted to make some more space. My first computer was like six, mm, six gigabytes. And uh, yeah. Now this this looks much bigger than this now, and this is the same size. You see, it's the same size because that is you now color. This seems smaller, so it's just a, an illusion. Okay, I'm gonna let this dry, and I'm gonna film. How I put on the on the color I use on it, so you can see that I'm gonna show you the textures in the end. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to show you some close-ups of the textures I put in. You can see how it looks. Uh, I flattened it out more here, and you see that the the structure from the canvas is basically gone and it won't disturb your eyes. If you're going to paint a painting with uh, a small people in it it's even more important because then it will really disturb it and if you to paint portraits and stuff like that, it's really disturbing. So cover it up. You see a little maybe a little bit still okay okay here we are the last thing uh, I'm going to zoom in so you can see better like this now what I do now is that, that I I take Rohrenbo that is the one I uh, prefer to use uh, it is because it has some greenish properties. Uh, this one is Old Holm and is kind of a little bit more in the, um, a little bit more warmer. I used to use um, Vincent Newton and um, for this purpose I actually prefer Vincent Newton. Uh, or 
Michael Harding actually, because they are greener, but I don't have it right now, so it doesn't matter, it's now anyway. So I take my balsam turpentine, it's just ordinary turpentine, a crema, it's this called, I don't know why, but that's what, and I just pour it on my paper. I might just do like this. You see this has more like a brownish reddish tone. Uh, almost like uh, blonde turtle for some reason. I don't know. But this it's actually good here because the the color in the painting is actually quite warm. Uh, the point I'm only using, do not use medium, do not use any linseed oil or anything like this or like that because what will happen then is that the surface becomes way too fat and you will get into trouble when you're starting to add layers with paint uh, on top of it. Uh, you can actually risk that it won't stick and that it will crack and do all that. So try to keep it as dry as possible. Now you see, I see all the textures showing up. But also, it is more like a mosaic now, almost like a, like a wall in a way. What you can also do, of course, is, is to bring out some of the light, if you want to kind of bring out uh, uh, light straight from, uh, you take, just take away a lot, and you see that the white are coming through again. So you can actually do this, and then you can start removing, uh, like, uh, here's the landscape, and then you can remove it in the light areas. That is possible, let you make that lighter. But for me, that is, it's just something you can do. Like here, the reflection in the water. Okay. So, in a way, I, I can actually now, you see here, you can actually bring out the whole landscape. I could, I could stand here and make the landscape actually directly <laughs> on, uh, on here without, uh, yeah, you know what I mean. Um, let's see if I can get some. It's quite fun, I haven't done this actually, I figure out now. Well, it's logical. But then again, I prefer to start on a, on a canvas that is uh, see now a canvas that is uh, dark. But I'm, I'm going to try this just for fun. Ah, oh, the trees are up there, yeah. And then I can actually, yeah, the trees are here. And the lightest areas are here. And then you can actually go in and you can start scratching in it. And you can start really and just have fun. You know? uh, there's a here, you see here. There's a rock. And here. Here, like this, and boom, you have a <laughs> landscape. This was fun. Yeah. So there's all kinds of stuff you can do. You can go as far as you please. Um, yeah. I'm going to put some more on actually, because this is not 
how I want to do it. So I think it was just fun to, to show you the possibilities. Now, when I've done this, it will actually stick a little bit too. So, right. you see, it will be a little bit different. Uh, so, there's a lot of stuff you can do, and uh, you build, you can use it as clay, you can do all kinds of stuff. But make sure that this is dry and that yeah that you have so this is nice I'm gonna show you all the nice brush strokes now see the brush strokes here I'm gonna show you more close-ups of this stop Yeah, one little small thing. When you are finished putting on the Rohenbach or whatever color you have chosen to tone it down with, it can be anything, you can choose that yourself. Uh, wait a day at least before you paint on it or the color you put into it will be mixed into the oil paint that you Put on it and that is very important I forgot to say that in the main video I just want to tell you here so you know and um, you can also of course not do that and see what happens but that is up to you I prefer to let it dry a day and maybe I hang it over an oven or something then the colors uh, is kind of absorbed into the gesso some of it and it's dried out and it's time to start painting on it okay okay here we are finished and show you here if you can see the hopefully you can actually see the brush strokes now how the uh, gesso has created already see here ah uh, shit I want to focus so yeah there you see you see those lovely textures it's almost like a, almost like a finished painting if you look at Turner's paintings you see a lot of these things in the paint how he has built it with paint or maybe even the grounding I don't know Rembrandt used some other stuff uh, the classical way of doing this is to do with rabbit skin glue or stuff like that but I I just stopped doing that because it's too much stress and I found that it wasn't so stable and I did so many strange things with my paintings that some of them that I did 20 years ago are still not dry so <laughs> anyway you see how it turns out in textures when you do this and I love it because it is it's cheap it doesn't cost any paint the gesso is quite ex it's not that expensive but it's good quality and I'm using also old Holland paint so it's quite expensive paint and therefore if you don't have so much money like my friend Kyle said well you sold home that's thirty dollars a piece <laughs> I love actually no this is Norway it's actually more and for the cadmium things it's really expensive uh, much more than thirty dollars anyway uh, thank you for watching this video I hope you got something out of it and this one is basically for I did it because my friend Kyle actually asked me a question so here's the answer and I 
will probably paint this painting. So I will of course post that video when that time comes. Uh, remember to uh, share my videos on social media, give them a thumbs up, leave a comment, of course subscribe, put the bell on so you get notifications when I put on new videos and uh, feel very free to become a patron. Uh, if you do I will of course uh, engage with you personally and you can also add me on Facebook. Uh, there's a link to my Facebook pay profile underneath for people who become pro patrons, only patrons. Um, yeah, I think that was it. So until next time, I stay cool. Okay, hello, another day, another video. Uh, in this video I'm explaining what pencils I use uh, and how I use them. It starts with me sitting down and explaining which pencils I use, why I use them and stuff like that. And then I show you on a canvas, on a actual portrait, uh, how I actually apply them on the canvas. And in this particular lesson I'm painting a rose and surroundings around that in a dress with a rose like this so uh, yeah and it was also actually an uh, answer to a patron question so um, if you like to be a patron if you like me to teach you how to paint there is a couple of things you can do you can go to patron there's a link in the description and you can and on my channel and you can uh, sign up for a five dollar patron and if you do I will help you with um, uh, true Facebook or true patron or with videos and stuff and if you want me to live stream with you a couple of times a month or whatever you can do a thirty dollar patronage and then I will actually spend some time with you so, on, uh, on uh, a live stream so go check it out Anyway, give this video a thumbs up, leave a comment and share it with your friends and help me rebuild this, uh, this channel because my other channel was actually hacked in January and it's really hard to get into the algorithm again. So please help me spread a message and uh, keep watching, keep painting, keep living, having fun and stay cool. Yay! So... Um... I got this question from uh, one of my patrons so, and it was about which uh, pencils I used and I'm gonna answer the questions he sent me um, by video, this Tom Tom Bard. Hello Knut, blah blah blah, and um, let's see, uh, I would like you to know about how to move paint on a canvas, okay, I'm gonna make a little video tutorial about that after this, in the same video, uh, uh, told me to use paint from the tube, yes, I use the paint from the tube straight like this because if you see uh, and I use old horn uh, I have some reds the yellows over here and um, you know the other colors here but the thing with these these um, these da Vinci brushes is that they are quite uh, they are hard but not too hard so they are qu they are quite flexible, but then again not so flexible. Plus one thing, they do not start to spread like a yeah like a, when you paint it, they kind of keep themselves together. They here so it doesn't disturb the process, and you get packages like this Da Vinci. I don't know if you can get it where you live or but. 
Uh, if you can get pencils like this, I like this set because it has all the ones and it's quite cheap. It doesn't cost much. So uh, it's not the, probably not the best quality, but it works for me. And here you have the smallest ones. When I and 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 I like the flat because it gives me control over the pencil strokes when I when I move it across the, the, the canvas. I'm going to show afterwards. But I also use. Bigger ones, of course, that I buy that are more expensive. This one is basically maybe it's some some medium in it something, but they're quite big, and that's for bigger surfaces. Uh, I usually paint quite big, so I need bigger. Okay, and many times I, I do actually do whole big paintings with just these because. The small ones are the ones that you are using up first. So if you make small paintings, you usually have a lot of these uh, after a while. And when you start painting big ones, you can burn these ones too. Uh, and uh, because the, when you're standing for hours and hours and hours and you do these movements, you start to rip up the, the uh, hairs. And then it starts to form in the direction you usually use it. And actually it can be quite nice to have a pencil. So don't throw it away, just wash it. And you wash it in green soap or ordinary natural soap. You don't use any turpentine or anything when you wash them. You just wash them in, in and you can also put some soap into them. So, so all the oil color that is in between doesn't dry. And when, before you start painting, you just wash them again. So you can start painting. Uh, but I also, you know, when I, I paint for a while, they kind of become like this in the end, you know, and this one is of course dead now. But in the end, it's quite nice to have things like this that's, that isn't hard because you can use it to, well, other things, you know, well, you figure it out after a while. Anyway, and I, for detail, these are also, uh, these are synthetic, they, they are bought on the store, right? they're called Ken, it's a, a store that sells uh, equipment. But this one is uh, a different, uh, Raphael or something like that, but this is more, I guess this is synth synthetic, but this is for minute detail, details like eyes and and maybe if you want to make a uh, uh, make a shadow between two lines or something like that, you use these two hard. And I usually, when I'm finished painting, you must wash them in 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 soap, and you put some soap into them, so you guarantee that you don't that you don't uh, they don't dry and get ruined. Like I have a couple of that I've forgotten. Can see how that went the whole thing just becomes a little bit not so flexible anymore and I have to kind of chew on it to get all that and I have flat ones here too and you can get these in all all kinds of, uh, of uh, types I guess. And you can also use uh, sablon but they are very expensive so when you paint oil uh, uh, I might recommend some some synthetic because this one is, is quite nice. It's synthetic for big surfaces like this. This is also synthetic. It tends to make all the surfaces very uh, very glatt, uh, 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 as it's called in Norway. It becomes too rigid it becomes too flat yeah too flat there's no there is no um there is no brush strokes left after you're finished so what happens when you use these uh, these uh, pig <laughs> made of pig hair is that they leaves the the nice strokes is it kind of binds the colors together inside when you paint and that is why i when i paint i tend to to grab color like this 
and I grab a color like this and I grab for instance a red like this and when I do a brush stroke some of the colors are oh, oh, it's quite dry here so I have to get some attempt to get into the brush but you see now you see you create these almost uh, rainbow like strokes where all the colors just goes into one another and you can put in some blue and you get some green there and you get some red there so you keep crossing over colors like this in in different directions on the canvas and and you create some kind of a micro impressionist painting which when light hits it would just be an amazing um, dance of different colors on all levels big strokes small strokes and uh, that's how I do it and you just have to practice and 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 just learn how to do it because I remember what I did when I first started out painting I used to do like this and I I mixed the colors on the palette and I tried to find the right color on the palette before I went to the canvas and I, I kind of do, still do it but I will say I usually just know approximately which color is gonna be there and I grab it and I add color into the strokes on the canvas and you just keep on piling on. It's it's hard to explain. It's like I should explain how to play a piano. It's it's very difficult to explain. So the reason why I use these and these are called Da Vinci. Maybe you find some other that have the same properties uh, where you live. Uh, but I prefer, and you don't need to buy the most expensive ones. The, the, you buy things that look so unbelievably great and. And they cost like so much money, and you forget to watch them one, watch them once, and they are just gone. And this is uh, to a uh, kind of a round one. You get also get round pencils in in uh, in uh, in uh, this uh, this is probably a sable sable thing. I don't even know what I got here. You get them, yeah. I, I, it's it's broken now, but this is also pigs here. You for, see what happens if you forget to wash it. It just gets ruined. It you throw it away. It's sad because of course it's money out of the window too. So this is a different one. It's also Da Vinci, and it's also made of pigs here. So uh, a boar or pig or whatever they call it. Maybe I can fix it. I don't think so. Just have to throw it away, uh, and they also come in. I think there's Da Vinci also in in different sizes. So you go on the internet and find Da Vinci. So probably, and they come in these ones. You see what happens when you forget. Sometimes I've been working for so long that almost I I can't even get myself to the bathroom and actually wash them, and then comes like this so and this one too it's a I don't really use these much the synthetic ones because of what I told you it becomes like a glass almost and it mixes the colors together in a way that makes the it makes the makes everything look every texture look the same you have to create different textures from uh, to, to make a painting uh, uh, come alive. And you can scrape with the back and you can use your nails if you have that. And I also always keep keeps this one on top of my on my arm. So I hold this like this and I just play. As you can see in some of my videos on YouTube. Uh, yeah, now I'm gonna just show you how I use use it on I'm gonna paint a little rose in, in uh, one of my paintings I'm gonna just gonna have a little tutorial how I think when I do it and see if I have forgotten some question that was asked 
Ahnung. Was, äh, so. Äh, answering my own question. Hm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, how long before you paint back onto the first layer? There are two ways you can do that. If you can paint, keep painting wet and wet, you can actually build and build and build. But at some point, you can't actually add more. And the, 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 the last details, or the, the, the more details it comes, the more good it is that it's a little bit dry between the layers. It doesn't have to be all dry. It just has to be so you can actually add more without the strokes under dissolving and and uh, coming into the new paint but you can also paint a whole painting and then go back the day after and keep adding paint but then you have to start using your hands so you don't uh, mess up what's under so you can keep on piling on you can keep on building the, the cloth and the textures and all that for, for days actually until you let it dry for the first time. But you can also lay one layer and make it dry for a few days and then you just go back and you keep painting. As I said before, I use a 70% of uh, linseed oil, cooked linseed oil and 70, no, 30%, uh, sorry, 70% turpentine and 30% linseed oil, cooked. And it should be surface dry within a few days if it isn't too cold in, in the place you are working. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's 10 days or less, you just have to figure it out. Uh, I don't. I, I have one. I first thought to hold a towel in my s okay oh yeah that's the main thing okay mm. No, you don't uh, light. So, yeah, yeah, there was this one. Uh, da Vinci, uh, what about these brushes that you like to allow uh, or allow? The result? I was thought to move the brush strokes along the path the light falls. Yeah, I don't know who thought you that. I don't see the point. Uh, the thing is to add paint and add texture. What you see, try to repeat what you see. And of course you think in directions, but that is actually in the directions of the, is this direction compared to that direction and so on. But all of this is just a dance, so you just have to keep on piling on. Uh, you can't have rules like, oh, I'm just going to do it in a way that the light falls, because then it becomes too rigid. It's like playing the piano with one note, and that won't function. So, so um, just, just, Try to try to make things you paint like there's a big difference between this and this, and these two can't have the same texture or the same direction. So when you paint this one, you will maybe do this one and make the brush strokes more flat. And if you, if you have a surface of glass, contra this, maybe it's even a good idea to use these that doesn't give you any brush strokes at all, compared to this that will give you the brush strokes. And here you can actually go in one direction. But when it comes to this, you have to start building like, like this and like this, and, and you just have to start picture this is a canvas now and you just have to start building how, how it feels to you physically and there's a little cloth and you can go in and you can you can do all kinds of shit so like you do with one color this and then you got in more white and you go like this 
because the blue and orange in this is different it's a complementary contrast so you you add some more reddish or or something in this compared to that if it's you know you just have to keep keep seeing but there is only one rule you build from dark to to light uh, that's my rule anyway I darken the canvas and I build up to light. I start with the lightest areas and I just keep on piling on. Okay, I think that covers it uh, about the pencils. Um, so, how long before you paint back into the first layer? I can cover that. May I share them with you? Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, of course, can share your thoughts with me. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna paint a little and show you, and um, that's the next segment. So. Okay. Okay. Lesson number two. Now. Uh, when you see here, uh, there's a rose, and maybe it's a good thing that I show you what I'm working with. The roses, I hang it over there, so I get a direct uh, connection uh, that I see uh, there, and I repeat it there, so you know what I'm looking at. And the different, uh, like, like when you when you use these uh, pencils, it's like since it is more there is light behind here, I go in with a little bit of thick paint. Uh, you you have to think like you are creating this this um, almost three D thing. And I keep, now you see, it was a little bit too yellow, and I see it should be maybe a little bit more bluish with, or violet, somewhere around there, or greenish. But anyway, this is how I, I use these brushes, I kind of build, and I, then I start building close to that. Like this, like this, and go over it, and I see there are some um, it's hard for me to concentrate when I'm talking, I'm sorry to say, because my brain is not communicating with the center. See here, keep it down there a little bit. But then I start to also go into the other places with some of the same colors. Um, I want to lift it up a little bit. So then I go in and I do like this. And now it comes down to the pressure you add on the... on the. Now, first I went in and I pushed a little bit hard to get it in there. And when I'm gonna have this to this here, I, I go in and I'm more light handed and it doesn't matter how big the pencil is uh, when I then uh, are doing the rows I change colors I take some reddish and some blue and maybe even some black and I I go in and I make this shadow like this. I paint kind of down. Then I start to go in this way. And I kind of try to find, and in this picture actually, it's a little bit also a little bit out of focus. That can be a good thing because then you don't want to, you don't start to push it, put in too much too many lines where this necessary. If you look at uh, Gerhard Richter, he's very good at that. Uh, 
you see now, and I start to put in more colors. I want to darken it, so I go in that way maybe, in that way, and I just keep on. And I can see there is some some green actually inside there. You can probably can see it on the video. Then I take some yellow and I just slightly go in yellow or green and I kind of push it in here to get a more because there's a lot of red and it's a deep color but you will find the complementary contrast here as well so that's how I work and you can see that in my bigger videos or longer videos on YouTube if you want to enhance it I can take a I want some more. I use the um, Alzarine or Kaplak a lot and, and um, the primary colors like uh, cadmium red and cadmium yellow and uh, lemon yellow and these um, yellow, cadmium yellow lemon <laughs> I think it's called. You see now it start to come alive but I also want a more there's a leaf on the flower so I want that to so then I start dragging it this way so I maybe even get some of the white into that so it will create a more softer uh, trans uh, yeah softer uh, what do you call it or oh, Vagang on for Norwegian uh, yeah, you know what I mean softening out the, the difference between this and this uh, I need and here it does come in I'm just gonna go back and here it actually can come in because here I can actually use this which is more it's quite uh, flexible also but then I can actually go in and I can control a little bit more how I put it on see now certain and there's also a shadow down here but I kind of keep it in the dark I keep adding paint now you see it starts to come a little bit more alive and I also wanted to now I see now that I need to push this down a little bit and since the rows are in the reddish the shadow behind here is probably in the green. I also can use a little bit, just a touch of black. But then again, I push it down a little bit. And I can keep on going back and forth and back and forth until I feel that it starts looking like the object I'm, I'm painting. And what's really important is that don't cheat. I mean, I have never made a painting become... I've never been actually... I have never felt that any of my paintings reach the level I want them to reach. It's because of my skill set are good enough. And uh, I started painting when I was like 20, 21, 22. Uh, and um, it is kind of limited to how good you can get, maybe? I don't know, but anyway, my point was I'm never able to come to where I want to because of the skills, but I'm getting closer. But when I look at one of my when I, when I use a photograph, I try to 
also when I'm sketching, I also always try to reach as far as I can towards the the object. If it is a still life, it's the still life, the onion or the whatever. I always try to make it feel like I have exhausted all my <laughs> all my capabilities. You know, it's gonna it's not finished until it looks like the object you were going to paint. Of course, paint and photo are two different things, and it adds a, a dimension that that photo doesn't do. It adds more sculptural dimensions to it, and that's why I look at paintings not actually as as two-dimensional surfaces, but as uh, reliefs. And that's how you're going to think. You're not going to think about it as a two-dimensional, but you're going to build it as if you're going to build a real room on the canvas. And therefore, it's very important that you make all the all the textures different. Now you see, I just drag it down like this, and then comes right out and then later I can go out and I drag it in there and I go over it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again and then I put the lasur on which you probably have seen on YouTube and I paint over that again and I just keep going and going until I feel I'm getting somewhere so, now when you paint, you think directions, you can do this way, that way, this way, but try to see the direction. There are directions in everything. For some reason there are directions. This is probably how the physical world is built up. And, um, So, okay, I hope you get my point, I'm going to post a full video of this, of this process on YouTube, this file will not be a part of it, but I think, um, but you can see it from sketch to finished painting later. I hope this explains a little bit. You see here, she has this, like these pencils. She has this bond around her, her waist, or made of hemp or something, and that's where often pencils like this comes in, that you can go in and make these fine lines between. Then again, it can also be done with this, with only brush strokes. So you just have to paint. The best way to learn how to paint is to paint. See here, and I can go in like this, and like this, like here so it feels like that goes behind and to make that feeling even bigger or greater you put in some really thick there and then you just keep on working so mm. yeah there's a shadow on the layer and there is a metal thing holds it together. It's quite funny because in that metal thing there are greens and there are yellows and there are all kinds of colors. Actually bright green. So 
And that's the beauty, I think, about if you look at Vermeer's paintings. You have a, he has observed all these beautiful primary colors. And that is why his paintings are so alive. And Rembrandt understood exactly the same thing without actually knowing anything about the physics of it. So, it's quite exciting. I'm getting into the flow here, forgetting the time. But I hope this actually explains it. So, I'll just keep working on this. I hope it explains something for you. So, tell me what you think. Anyway, okay. if you sign up for a $5 patron, I actually also do a patron giveaway, a small painting, as you see I'm pointing at there uh, every month. So, if you want to get your hands on one of my paintings and not just be my student or have me as a, your mentor, you can actually sign up and also get a painting. And that is not bad. So check it out and help me rebuild and help me, yeah, become a better painter. Because I also learn when I learn teach you. So it's kind of reciprocal, as it's called. Okay, see you in our next video. I hope you enjoyed it. Hello, Norway. Or world. Anyway, I just made a short video, as about a half an hour, about how to uh, make uh, skin tones and how to use how I use the palette and which which colors I use and how I mix them. Uh, I have gotten a lot of questions about that, so I just want to make a short video that is to the point, so you can actually start to understand more about how to think when you paint. So, yeah, now remember to share and subscribe, share my videos and subscribe to my channel. It's very important. It's also important that you put on a notification bell. You put them in your playlists and share it on social media and all these things. It's also nice as more of you could actually become a $1 patron or a $5 patron. Remember, there is a monthly painting that is uh, given to one of my patron, uh, patrons so uh, uh, for five dollars so um, go there become a patron if not keep watching sharing and uh, enjoy the video hope you learned something stay okay, okay, okay. yeah uh, I get this frequent question about which colors I use when I paint a face and um, um, I thought I'm just gonna show you a little bit with this and explain a little bit with this tiny painting uh, first of all I have to build this is just a rough sketch but first of all I start to build the griselle as they call it but I use color when I do and then I have to start building all the all the different shadows and stuff and I use I'm going to show you my palette I'm just going to paint a little bit now and I'm going to uh, show you my palette while I'm painting and then back to the face and maybe back to the palette again and uh, uh, a face doesn't have one uh, skin doesn't have there's no skin tone color you have to uh, use the same rules as in nature when light hit hit the skin usually the lighter parts are in the reddish or orange and as the shadows uh, as you go down to the shadows you've got the blue and you got the deeper into the shadow you get you get maybe green and you get the yellows and you get everything and the, and the colors that i actually prefer to use is 
among others, uh, French Ultramarine. Uh, it is Cobalt Blue. And uh, I use a color called to break up the, you know, like in here, it is quite bluish and yellow. It has kind of a depth there. I'm going to talk more about the colors when I show you my palette. And then I go for the more green, but I cannot mix. I both mix my colors on the canvas and a little bit on the palette. It depends what I'm doing. If it's a, it's a big rough sketch or a landscape or something like that, I actually blend most of the colors on the canvas. If you're doing more detailed work, you have to do some of the blending on the palette, but also on uh, also on the canvas here. Uh, uh, what I do, I try to keep the colors clean. It's very important to me to keep the colors clean. Uh, two colors that create a very nice bluish or violet blue and then you can add some cadmium green and the cadmium yellow into it and some white maybe and you start to get this small um, deeper greenish reddish thing I'm going to just push it down here a bit because there's a shadow going in there. Now, in the, in there now, I'm going to use my cup lock or the Alsaline and some cobalt blue. I can also see there are some greenish in there. And what I need then is actually my my Naples yellow. Uh, Naples yellow uh, is nice because it kind of a Broken, quite broken, uh, yellowish kind of color. That is good to tone down. There is a nice, it's a nice uh, green if you put some blue into it. If you put some red into it, it goes through to the reddish scale. And I just keep on kind of molding. I see there's some more blue in there. Uh, and remember, this is just the beginning of the sketch. There's a lot of work to do here. But I thought I was just going to talk a little bit about what I actually do. Uh, it's also remember in the brightest where the where the sun hits or the light hits you get the warmest. That is also because it's the part of the where where the light hits first is usually on the highest levels that the, and that's why you get shadows. So so. Um, uh, actually, if the if the sun hit here, maybe there would be a shadow there and light on this side. Uh, so you just have to try to notice where uh, the light hits, and well, as I say, in the brightest you have the warmest colors. Well, that's my experience anyway. But that's where all the warmth is and uh, you just keep building on that notion now this girl has very nice cheekbones uh, and uh, there's a lot happening here that will later explain her face I'm actually making a full tutorial of this painting so you will get to see the result 
when it's done. This part of the video will not be in that one. This is just for for this segment about painting a face. Maybe I should try to focus a little bit on my palette now when I paint. So you can actually see what I'm doing. Actually, it's very liberating for me to work this this um, small. Because usually I do a lot of huge stuff and uh, I tend to it tend to take me a while. <laughs> it's all the small things, like she has a shadow here. So what color is in the shadow? That is how you have to think. If you see here or here, you see there's reddish and then it goes down into the green. And then the shadow is falling on something that is reddish in here or, or orange. And the shadow is actually a little bit violet. And that is because there, in violet there is some uh, red, which then becomes a complementary contrast to, to the greenish that is in her nostrils, if you get my point here. So after a while when you think like that and you keep building, you will actually see these things. It's a very tiny painting this so it is nothing that to fuck it up you know it's like wow <laughs> you touch it and then boom you change the whole thing and then the good thing then is that I can go in with clean color and I can kind of pull it up again and then Push it down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Uh, and nostrils inside here. There's a lot of stuff I have to correct, I see that. And also this camera gives it a kind of a uh, wrong perspective. I, I would like to buy myself some equipment so I could have the camera like here. But not come into conflict with the stuff that I'm using. So just see if I can I can find money to do that soon so I can make better videos for you. And that will of course means that you have to become my patrons so I can better myself in my video production. <laughs> it's all up to you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I'm going to fill my palette for a while and then go back to the face. So you see what I'm doing on the palette so I can explain to you which colors I use. Okay. Okay, here we are. The palette. You see I'm using a smaller palette now to do this. Uh, also use this small beautiful uh, brushes from Da Vinci. It is a bristle, boar, bristle, pig, pig's hair. Uh, I like that because it gives a very nice texture. But I also like these synthetic ones also from it's also from Da Vinci. I use basically Da Vinci these days for some reason. I kind of found that. Now you have this small, this one. It comes in packages. I wish I could buy them loose because I spend many of these. Uh, anyway, what I was talking about. This is um, what is called. It's a pr brilliant gel reddish. Uh, yeah, brilliant gel reddish, uh, and that is. Um, Brilliant gel, gel light, yellow light, brilliant gel, yellow light, and that is Naples yellow light, and that is Naples yellow, there's cadmium yellow, that is um, a cadmium yellow lemon kind of cadmium, 
and that's cadmium lemon cad, cadmium um, yeah cadmium dark or whatever and that is cadmium orange vermilion and you have um, uh, the of course um, uh, cadmium red and you have the alsarine I'm talking about this is a Prussian blue cobalt blue and French ultramarine that is burnt uh, burnt umber raw umber uh, van Dyke brown and um, uh, burnt uh, sienna and now that was burnt sienna and burnt raw sienna this is burnt umber and this is raw umber and black okay uh, it's uh, it's uh, ivory black it's all it's all uh, old holland i really like old holland they have a thickness to it when you kind of drag you can see when i i like the fact that when you take some yellow and you put it into the red actually when you use these bristle pencils you kind of becomes a micro a micro uh, impressionist uh, thing because you're not actually mixing the colors together you're kind of just uh, putting them on top of each other or inside like in the stripes and stuff so that's what I do right now. I'm not going to use this one. I'm going to use the synthetic one that I was using. I hate when it start to the bristle starts to yeah be ruined. But anyway, so what I do skin highlight. I might use some uh, vermilion or some of this, and I just do like this uh, first. Uh, maybe I want to put in some yellow to get it a little bit orange and then I put it on the canvas in the light area I might put in some highlight because over time despite that I'm gonna paint over and over this many many times I put in highlights again and again and when I when I When I do the glaze and I start over again, this texture starts to create the sculpture effect that I'm after. Now, I want to go a little bit deeper, so I take the, the uh, Alsarine and the Naples Yellow, which creates some kind of a uh, broken orange type of... of uh, and I just find where that and then I can take some blue and I can put into it and I can get towards the blue and I can take even more blue as I want to go deeper into the shadows and but it's, it keeps that kind of greenish type of uh, feel to it so yeah you see I do like this usually I, I don't mix so much as you can see I don't mix so much medium into the into paint I do like this and then I take the color so I'm actually painting quite dry uh, if you paint too wet it's gonna become very oily and it's gonna be ugh, kind of hard to deal with uh, what I've been noticing during the years I've been painting is that the oil is going to get into the paint anyway because you keep repeating the same patterns and every time you stick in here do like that you get some of the oil into there you clean it and you take new color and also you don't want to I'm gonna do some some reddish stuff here uh, Yeah, that was a little bit too much, so I go back here and I pick up this and then I go back to it and and that's how I do. I kind of tone stuff down, I go back and forth to until I basically find the right 
hue and the right color as I paint. Yeah, that's what I do. Now this is very small, very fun. Um, yeah. Now I'm not gonna I'm not using so much of these colors while I'm painting now. I'm staying on the light side of the the more uh, the light colors you see I'm using basically the color circle. Remember there's something that is very important. If you take blue and you take this, you get green. Okay? And the more blue you add, the more green you get. If you this one, it gets quite dark. Then again, if you take the Prussian blue, which is the strongest one, it's like, whoa, you can't get it off if you get on close. It becomes very vivid. So there's a big difference between the different colors. And uh, But if you wanna, want the shadow to the green, you know what you're gonna do to get the shadow to the green? And this is what happens in nature with all complementary colors. If I now take Okay, let me take cadmium red and I go in with this broken green and I do like, oh, sorry, it was too much. I do like this, then I get the shadow color to the green and then I can vary it. If I want to have more against the, yeah, the, against the yellow, this will of course change accordingly because you, you kind of the mixing is about one third if you have green you put in like uh, one third red now two thirds red and then you get the shadow color and this is happening all over nature the it just uh, the the shadows in it, the the shadows in a, in a cloud is basically this is what's happening in in the light in the cloud you have the red and you have you have some kind of variation of orange with a lot of light and that's why if you really look at a cloud you will actually notice that the light areas are always in the complementary specter. They're clean colors, usually clean like orange, yellow, reddish and stuff. But not, not all reddish or all green, uh, all yellow or all... Yeah, but to get the shadow, the shadow color of the what's in the hair, you have to go down to... Uh, Say that this is orange, uh, and orange is uh, complementary to what is it? Complementary to blue, blue and orange. So, to get the shadow color, you need to mix some orange and some blue. So, say people think it's gray, but it's not gray. It depends exactly what kind, but this will be when you make a cloud. This will be the shadow color. Since this is a cl pure color, uh, if it's a pure orange, you can use pure blue, and it mixes in with the orange in the white. So you get a broken, a broken yellow, not broken blue that actually is the shadow color and the more the deeper you get the more you add and if you want to go real deep you really need to put in some so this is how the specter works and this is how I'm using my palette when I'm not talking I can do this um, mindlessly <laughs> if you say I'm not I'm not actually thinking about what I'm doing because I've been doing this for so long so it's just an automatic thing for me. And that is also how you create skin. You do it as it should be anything. It doesn't matter if it's a face, if it's skin, 
or if it's a cloud or it's a sea or anything. It's the same rules. It's the complementary colors and the shadows are made by the broken uh, complementary colors which are broken with the complementary color of, yeah, you know what I mean. I've been discussing this now. This is, <laughs> sorry, my French. Uh, it's kind of hard for me to explain this good enough. But I hope you get something out of it. Anyway, if you, wanna, if you want a surface or painting to live, you have to paint as nature does. And pa nature only paints with pure color. There is no black, there is no gray, whatever that is. I have no idea what gray is. Oh, it's so, that cloud is gray. No, it isn't gray. It's a mix between the complementary colors and the tertiaire, or the third colors. The mixture of what's underneath and what's in the light. And this goes again in this face. And it is what is happening in everything in nature. And the day you see that, the day you see the cloud, the colors, you look out the, up to the sky and you see the colors. I'm not talking about the night sky because that is easy. Okay. But the day sky. When you actually, most people think the clouds are just white. And that is why they are painting them white when they are amateurs, because they don't know all the colors that are in this white. Yes, to make something live, you have to work on the same premise as nature. So, yeah. I'm also going to do a quite big garden painting soon it's a lot of flowers there's a lot of colors and then i'm gonna work impressionist and i'm gonna also focus on the palette then so you can actually get a feel to how i'm using the palette when it's a big palette and i'm just mixing the colors uh, faster so yeah i'm gonna do a little bit more on the face so you can see and uh, yeah, hope this is helpful. As I say, there are no such thing as a skin color. Everyone who tries to sell you a skin color, that's bullshit. It doesn't exist. So we are back to the face thing. And I'm gonna, not this video is not gonna be that long. But now you see, I showed you how I use that palette. Uh, you know, it's maybe more helpful for people to see some shorter videos. You know, she has a lot of jewelry. Everything, all of this, I will paint into this painting. Uh, so, so again, shadows, greenish blue. Uh, the light areas, the warm colors. I really black in this isn't necessarily useful actually. But it's nice to have it there because you if you if you use black, you have to know how to use it. If you overuse black, you will kill everything I know actually quite good painters who are killing everything with their overuse of black and it just becomes stiff unnatural and dead because all the colors are just dying and that is just sad uh, so be careful with the use of black it is like this I heard about Rembrandt once and well, not once but many times and he used they say he only used black in the depth of the eyes I don't know if that is true but to create that deep extremely deep uh, infinity 
look in the eyes he actually used black there and of course if you don't didn't use black anywhere else on the canvas the eyes would actually feel like a hole a deep hole that would just fall and fall and fall into it so yeah I'm sorry I'm not getting done much uh, uh, sculpturing here but the, the video isn't about that and here you see underneath here the light from here will always go up here and it can explain the cheek underneath there now I have a job to do with the cheek and the face and everything but I see that uh, I'm a little scared of touching it because it's so small, so tiny. And I kind of like the sketch, so... But I know I have to kill it so many times to get to the point where I want, because I want it to look like her. I want it to be like this, at least as close as I can. You also have to remember, I'm not, I'm not a photorealist painter. Uh, I'm not that good. And uh, I'm not that good technically. I'm not a technical painter I'm more a painter's painter so I just try my best I didn't go to any school I didn't learn how to paint I went to an art school actually and but you didn't learn how to paint actually and the only thing they wanted me to do there was actually not paint and do, do more conceptual art and stuff but I always already have decided to be a painter uh, because I had this teacher in a drawing school, a one-year drawing school, and she, she made me fall in love with with paint and the classics and Munch, especially Sik Pika or Sik Girl. Actually, I want to do a copy of that one or a rendition, or I'm also going to do some other ones of my favorites to my next exhibition that will be called the art of painting i hope so i want to do some uh, copying of or my version of one of the greatest paintings i know which is of course the art of painting of Vermeer, the night watch of Rembrandt. it's a huge painting in reality so i can't paint it the same way I was wondering if I'm going to do uh, Sick Child of Edvard Munch because that is also one of my total favorites. So I'll just see what happens. Now my hips are doing well after the first operation. I started to get my energy back because I'm not in constant pain. And when I get the second one done, I will be, I will probably feel like I'm 20 again. There is so much happening in her hair in this. There's so much happening. I can just keep working. And when I put on my music, because I'm, when I'm talking to you, it's actually quite hard to get into that flow. But when I put on music and I just go into my zone, oh, it is just the best thing I can do. I mean, if I should, I should picture myself an afterlife, it has to be in being in that constant flow, that being and not being. This this constant beautiful flow with with the dopamine are in balance. You are not high, but you are high. You are not too active, but you are really active on the right levels. On the right, yeah. So okay, that was a digression. But if there should be any reason for me to paint at all, it is reaching that beautiful feeling that just gives me a sense of purpose in life and everything. 42. <laughs> Let me see. Yeah. You see, I have to do a lot of stuff on a nose and everything, but I will film when I do it in the video that will show you the whole painting process. So stay tuned 
it will be out in not too far I guess I also do doing a lot of other videos so remember to put the notification bell on and uh, help me spread my art well you see I have to oh I'm getting into that Ooh. anyway I'm gonna stop now because I think I've explained what I wanted to explain and I hope you get something out of it uh, and I see you later Hi, me again. Uh, in this video, I'm just talking about how to make a um, uh, sky, how to think, how to use the brush. And I think you might find it interesting. Uh, I'm still working on this painting. I'm going to have it in an exhibition in two weeks, actually. So I just have to keep on going. Um, it's only 12 minutes long. So. And I think it's quite informative. It is about uh, how to make a sky and all the shit that I'm just has on my heart, I guess. So remember, subscribe, share my videos, and make a comment. Tell me what you think. I'm also wondering about starting to starting to um, do some streaming uh, on Twitch or YouTube, but. Uh, I'll see what I do. Uh, I'm not sure. You can also comment on that if you want to. Uh, if you think it's a good idea. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Peace and love. Yeah. Well, I'm working on a background now, and there's some houses in the background, and I'm trying to keep them loose and keep them uh, in the distance. And then I, I'm gonna go close with the video when I'm finished with it, and just talk a little bit about it. But it's all only like grabbing color and and um, uh, thinking like an expression impressionist, the impressionists, and put on lights. As you see, the, the light is coming that way, so you have to get the. But then again, you don't want to. You want that. Don't want that light to be as bright as this light. So you have to uh, kind of keep it down with the hue or the color. Uh, that is also what you do when you uh, put a lazur. You see, I'm just touching it directions. And, um, you don't want everything to all the light. You know this this light is in the distance. It's actually the same as in the universe. If you see distant stars, the red light shift changes compared to the distance and the speed. Um, and it's the same principle on Earth in nature. It's like uh, yeah, sound waves in a way. So I go over here with some shadows. Now it's obvious, must be obvious, why I can't show you the whole paint process. Uh, I have been wondering about starting to stream on Twits or on YouTube and people could maybe donate and ask me questions like if you want to donate like one or one dollar to a million it doesn't matter it's just a token uh, if you feel you learned something from my videos you don't have to, you can ask me questions, I'm happy to 
answer all your questions. It's kind of my contribution to my small contribution to humanity. If you know what I mean, give something back, as Arnold Schwarzenegger said. Give something back. <laughs> Anyway, the point is now I'm going to do some in the background and when I do this is you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to sky that is too perfect. You, you want it to live a little bit. So these pencils, these um, uh, brushes, uh, the, um, the bore shit. Interesting shit. Well, welcome to my life. Uh, so You don't want it to be too perfect. And these brushes. Are giving you some texture. When you put on the colors. You have to work. Back and forth. And you kind of. Push colors into one another. You get all these strokes and if you so you see I'm kind of mixing the color on the canvas. First it's too bright and then I just This is how I go over the whole thing. Now it's quite dry here, so, so I have to work with it a while until it kind of I find the right tone. And that's what I do. I, I work on it until I find the right tone. But you don't want to use these feather brushes if you want a if you want a very nice painted surface. You don't want this these paint these um, these um, yeah you know this feather like the the ones that just brush everything out and it becomes this ah, it looks nice but you know, it's, it, it doesn't rock it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't do anything and it's so fucking boring you need to get 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 the, to live like the sky. The sky is many colors in, in, in the sky. It's reddish and it's green and it's red and it's orange and it's yellow and it, it's compare how uh, down here is more reddish than it's kind of greenish and it goes over to a brighter blue and and there's so many colors and you have to just try to see that and and, uh, and understand how it works. Because I was working on this yes last night and it actually is so thin that it almost it's almost dry and then it's that is why when you work on a on a sky like this or a whole I work on uh, things around the model, around the figure, trying to put in many hours so you can go over the whole thing in one go. Because when the when the color is wet, it's easier to kind of mold all the different colors to get them crisscross. Uh, so, yeah. 
when I get it dry, I can actually start molding like this again. No, I mean, sorry, make it uh, not dry, but wet. I'm Norwegian, I'm a, it's my second language. I never, I wasn't good at school. I was good in, in talking, like talk English, but I couldn't write it. So, but I, I can hear that my vocabulary isn't as good as it should be. So maybe I should <laughs> start reading more books and, and uh, get better at it. It's easier to communicate when you actually know the language. The lingo. Most Norwegians, I mean, the politicians are horrible to listen to when they're talking. talking English. Even the prime minister is just a little. I'm listening to tons of of uh, science lectures and documentaries and stuff so I guess I've learned my English through watching movies, documentaries, audiobooks. I'm, I'm a dyslectic, uh, partly dyslectic, also write with both my hands. So when I come actually this doesn't work for me. I was wondering, starting to train, since I can write with both my hands, I should be able to paint with both my hands, but, I mean, the brain works like, works, connects the, the neurons compared to what you do, so I could actually learn it. I, I used to weld, I was a welder, and I used to weld with both hands. And yeah, I have to have some light. <sighs> so maybe I should try. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna buy myself a piano. Start learning how to play the piano. I'm thinking about it for many, many years, like 15 years. Since I saw the Gary Oldman and uh, I saw Gary Oldman play uh, Beethoven, it's a beautiful movie. I recommend it. Gary Oldman as Beethoven. It's a beautiful movie. You know, and I love Rachmaninoff and I love all the classics. And so I would like to. To find out how how to do it, you should just buy one and start. I know nothing, next to nothing. But if I could go from welder to painter, I lived it over twenty years with all the partying and. Uh, waste of time that I used to do I should be able to learn how to play the piano yeah blah 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 I feel great actually and uh, yeah so this is this small video uh, this short video is it's not long to become so short but this video is a part of a bigger one, so you just have to watch it. Hi YouTubers, uh, I am working with a big landscape and I just made a short video where I explain 
how I work with some nuances, uh, how I work with these uh, different uh, things, you know, from uh, how I'm crossing over with the colors to avoid too much uh, lines and, and form the colors in relation to nature's laws. And you might find it interesting. I will post a full process video of the whole painting later, but this video is just about that thing there. Okay, so I almost fell over. My studio, big place. So Thanks for watching and uh, remember to share my videos, uh, subscribe to my channel and if you find it useful and interesting and want to support my channel you can press the donate button or you can become a patron on Patreon. <laughs> I'm gonna try to build that out and have a maybe even a monthly price later when people start to um, become patrons. Okay, have a good one. So, the cloth. Uh, I use in kind of the same technique there too. It's just different layers, no, different um, colors. But it's also the same colors that I use here except from the yellow. So, I keep kind of I'm kind of making, making it wet, so I can keep going up and down, up and down. Uh, it all, 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 always starts with this rough sketch. Um, now, so I did a little bit, the, just a mark it to uh, where I was going. And inside here you have a lot of, actually a lot of uh, Prussian blue, greenish, and what I do in the end is of course going in with the, with the lasur and stuff like that when I have have gotten it up or down to the, gotten that, that the right feeling, the woolly, right woolly feeling. Uh, but right now it's just building, kind of building a light, and there's a light hitting here, and that is also it isn't as as bright as this one and the background. So I have to be careful. I have to kind of do this with my eyes, so I see the difference between this and this. And now there's almost none, so I have to find. Uh, the right, yeah, the right hue, a bit more white, so it's hard to see but anyway I'm gonna stick with what I was doing and try to lift now on this side it's more reddish and it's greenish over here but here it is in the green again because of the reddish that are on this side where the light hits so that's the whole that is the whole thing you want the painting to start living, you have to paint it as nature does. And nature of painting everything with, uh, or giving colors to everything with uh, uh, the color circle or the primary colors. And if you understand that, it becomes very much easier to to see because then you start looking for 
what you know. It's like I remember the first time when I I went to a drawing school and I had this this teacher, Cecil Cobosta was her name, and she taught me taught me about the color circles and primary colors and manic as I am, I went into this with the biggest pounding heart in the universe. And I started to see what I was thought in everything, in shadows, in, in the sky, in shadows, in the clouds, in, in nature, in leaves, and in... I started to see the greenish and the reddish and the blue and the violet and the yellows and the oranges. I saw an orange, I saw it all over. It was, a, it was almost like suddenly the world went from just nuances of colors which I could put a name to if there were colors around me to seeing colors in every single nuance every single thing in shadows in in the whites in the sky uh, in the clouds and everything things I haven't noticed before and I think there is not many painters who is actually who is actually talking about these things. And uh, that is kind of what I try to teach people who ask me, or trying to teach you, who is watching this video, if you are not gotten to that point where you can actually see it yourself. But go out, take the color circle with you, take Goethe's father of color, color theories with you out in nature and start, start watching what colors are the leaves really are they. Because sometimes we can think they look green but they are kind of red. <laughs> you, it's like you start to observe the world and it just opens up like a child in the kindergarten, you know, it's like, it's like in a, in a, in a not kindergarten, but in a candy store, yeah, or a child in the candy store, that's the right thing to say, I guess. So, you see how I work, if it was more light here, I would have put on thick colors, but this is basically this is basically the, the lightest part of this painting, so I have to keep everything down to make this vivid. And there are also some very nice things in the clouds and stuff because it's a big, it is a big uh, landscape. So I hope you get something out of it, and of course I will post the whole process video later so enjoy yay